Welcome to the Health and Wellness Talk Show with Dr. Daniela Stein. Dr. Stein is a medical doctor, wellness expert, and assistant clinical professor in family medicine. Her mission is to inspire and enable you to live your best possible life with optimal health. Prevent disease through healthy lifestyle choices and use food as medicine to support longevity, energy, mental clarity, happiness, and well-being. Join us today as she interviews guests empowering you to live your best life with optimal health. Connect with Dr. Stein at www.daniellastein.com. Subscribe to our YouTube channel today. Good day. I am Dr. Daniela Stein. I'm a medical doctor and a wellness expert. Today, I'm so excited to have Gina with me. Welcome, Gina. Thank you. It's a joy to be here. Please subscribe to this YouTube channel. Gina is back on popular demand. I've had a podcast with Gina before, and our audience was so excited, and they've sent me all these questions, very positive feedback. Thank you so much. And then they had more and more and more questions, and that's why I asked you back. So thank you so much for joining me today on our talk show. Gina is a certified nutrition practitioner. She's a wellness business owner. She's a wife. She's a mom of four children. She's a fitness enthusiast. She's just an amazing, amazing woman. And she's a health coach. That's a very big thing. <laughs> Gina, tell me a bit about yourself. Well, I think you covered a lot of it. But <laughs> and the I, health um, coaching. Yeah. How did you get into nutrition and, and, and coaching? Yeah, such a good, great, great question. So I have a nursing background. And what I really recognized by just seeing people um, day to day and kind of seeing people who came into clinic is that so much of what we were seeing could be things that people could prevent. And so I really wanted to get on the prevention side of healthcare and nutrition. And so this was like 10 years in the making, uh, going back to school to become a certified nutritional practitioner, a holistic nutritionist, and really being able to educate people. I get excited and fired up to share with people about what they can do to just um, change their health journey to help really support their body and nourish their body for optimal um, just to be able to feel their best, look their best, and, and really to have an optimal nutrition. And that's a big thing. That's what my wellness clinic is about because mm -hmm. I see people in hospital every day that I know if I've just met this person 10 years ago, 20 years ago, we could have prevented this. We could have prevented diabetes. We could have prevented high cholesterol. We could have prevented this heart disease. We could have prevented this cancer. There's autoimmune disease. There's so many things we can prevent exactly by, by taking steps 10, 20 years before. And, and that's why we have the topic today. Many of our listeners wanted to know more about it. And it's such a big topic. So our topic for today is sugar. Don't kill me because I do like sweets too. And I do enjoy some of that. Like I have a, a Greek and Italian heritage. And so food is a large part of our growing up. We gather around the table. But what I love to tell people is that it's not just about, it's sugar can be very addicting. And so it's reframing our ideas about what's good for us, how to fuel our bodies and really help share with people maybe some simple swaps and simple exchanges that they can make uh, to really feel their best. So first tell our listeners, why is sugar bad? Because that is a big thing. I now know that sugar is a number one driver for heart disease, for diabetes, stroke, autoimmune diseases, mm -hmm. leaky gut, for cancers. Mm -hmm. I know it now, but I didn't know it 20 years ago. I, I think the general population doesn't know how bad sugar is. It's so true. And I mean, I'm just going to share a quick story too, because I think even going through nursing school, I wasn't really educated about what it does to our body. And in fact, when we were newly married, Stephen and I would do like Friday night pig out nights and I would skip dinner altogether to have a movie and get like a huge tub of popcorn and extra big Twizzlers. And I would think, well, the calorie exchange is the same. Oh. Calories in versus calories out mm -hmm. and have that whole notion. But what we now know is not that. It's nutrients in and what our body craves are nutrients. And that kind of bad behavior of thinking I could like uh, work, work out extra, you know, and I would undo what the sugar was already internally doing 
was an incorrect notion. And I ended up with irritable bowel syndrome in my early 20s of this constant fluctuation and inflammation of my bowels. And so sugar is very addicting, isn't it? Yeah. And, and that's the hard thing because quite often and in my earlier years, I thought as well that I could eat a lot of sugar just because if you're at a normal weight, then you didn't think sugar is a problem. You didn't think you have to drink diet pop and go, you know, cut back on sugar if you're at a normal weight, mm -hmm. but it's still very harmful to your body. Absolutely. And we're even seeing now like the average Canadian consumes 26 teaspoons, 26 teaspoons of sugar a day. And that's hidden sugars. That's not adding 26 that's right. sugars to your coffee. It's sugar that... We don't, we don't necessarily don't see, see it, it in food, but even more so, the, the epidemic, we see that clinical obesity is happening younger and younger. Like one in three kids are diagnosed with obesity and they are saying 41 teaspoons, they're eating typically. And I was just listening to an amazing podcast actually uh, talking about how sugar affects the brain. And uh, when we're younger, our brain, our prefrontal cortex is not completely matured and it doesn't, that doesn't mature till the early twenties. And so our dopamine receptors earlier on are kind of, they're, they're looking for those hits. And so younger and younger kids are getting more and more addicted. And then it, it creates habits early that then leads into adulthood. But we're also seeing things like Canadians, about 60% of what we eat are highly processed or processed foods. So just full of sugar, refined things, not nutrient dense. Even interesting little fact, I remember growing up, my mom spent quite a bit of time meal prepping and we mm. had family dinners around the table with real food. Well, our meal prep has gone down to 15 minutes and that's people are looking for convenience. We've got full quick. lives. It's uh, quick. Yeah. And, the and more especially convenient, your mom with four kids, right? So you want to be quick. You don't want to spend hours in the kitchen. That's right. Exactly. Mm, so it's very easy. And it's I, I remember when I moved from South Africa, even before I moved, the first time I came to the U.S. on holidays was in 2002. We came to visit my husband's mom, who's immigrated to the States, and we stayed and we did a whole trip throughout the U.S. It was amazing. It was, I think, six weeks road trip. It was awesome. But then we would stay at a hotel at night and then get a breakfast of the next morning. Mm -hmm. And I was so lost as what to eat. Because in South Africa, the same all brand flakes we had that was completely sugar free, the same cereal, same brand was in in the States. It was so full of sugar that it was like candy. And then there were pancakes for breakfast and bagels and um, waffles. You know, I honestly didn't know pancakes and waffles can be a breakfast food. I honestly thought that it was a dessert. We would only have it at a, a, a Milky Lane was our place. It's an ice cream place where you can get waffles as well. Yes. So it baffled my mind. But now I'm here 20 years later and my children are making me pancakes yes. for breakfast. And, I, you, you know, what happens? And, and also our taste buds really change because in the beginning I noticed, oh, these foods are so sugary. Mm -hmm. But you get used to the amount of sugar. Absolutely, you do. And, and that's exactly what happens. More. We crave more and more and more. And we have to start looking at sugar almost like a drug because that's really what ends up happening. And in your brain, it has the same response. That's right. And so many studies have been shown, um, both animal studies and human studies. So there's studies about the brain that are linking sugar to be as addictive, if not more, than cocaine. So people drink or eat something that are high sugar and your brain just fires up with all these dopamine receptors. And there's been studies, a prison study done where they fed one group of inmates whole foods in really three square meals in a day. And then this other group, highly processed, full of sugar. And what ended up happening is they saw they were more aggressive, more violent behavior. Sure. Their attention was lowered. Sure. And we see this even, there was a, um, a rat a, a animal study that was done. Yes. Yes. yes Have you I've seen, seen that? that? Yes. It's, it's so... But tell all the viewers. Absolutely. Yes. So they had an IV uh, hooked up to, they were trained to go ahead and get their uh, hit of cocaine. And they were actually choosing sugar 
over Above cocaine. cocaine. So it's even eight more times addictive. more likely to go towards the sugar than the cocaine. So I think that's really important because we think that it's fairly innocuous. Oh, we're just going to have that little sweet. But what we're doing is we're actually creating that dopamine hit, mm. that sensation that we need it. And so it's this vicious cycle, isn't it? Of we love the way it tastes. It creates this feeling of satisfaction yes. and like, oh, I love it. And then we eat more and it's the cycle of addiction that just keeps happening and happening. I think the fascinating piece too is that what we find are there are these receptors, these dopamine receptors. For some people, those receptors are dulled. Yeah. And we're, we're seeing that in clinically obese people or overweight people because they're having so much sugar. They they're, need more sugar to get right. the same high. Yeah. Mm. And so what ends up happening is that they eat more and more, they consume more, and it's just this never-ending cycle. So we need to break the cycle. And for sure, if I just look at my parents, they would love to have dessert after every dinner, but then that dessert would be a block of chocolate, whereas I can easily eat the whole slab or the box, you know, where they would never, they would have the block, you know, yes. a block of chocolate, you know, so that, that clearly shows that upregulation. And that's something I see with my patients as well, when they, it's not about self-control. It's not that you don't have enough self-control, it's that your body craves it in yes. a way and it needs it in a way that you need that cocaine or dopamine, you know, it, it's, it's really a response. It is. And it's a physiological response. I think some people look at this like, oh, it's, it is a, a control. You don't have control willpower. over it. Willpower. I'm going to will myself. And it becomes a very physiological response. And so we have to do things like eating a diet that's full of whole foods and varied colors to be able to make sure that our gut health stays on track because what ends up happening happening is, you know, sugar affects so much in our body. And what ends up happening is the more sugar we eat, the more we dysregulate or have dysbiosis, mm. um, which is an imbalance in our gut flora. Then what happens is that we crave more sugar. And so again, it's really kind of stopping that cycle. And we can end up getting things like SIBO when we have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, when we're having too much of the bad bacteria. Because two things happen when we eat sugar. Number one, we take that beneficial bacteria and we lower it. And number two, we increase the pathogenic bacteria, the harmful bacteria. So we end up with this bacterial overgrowth and that ends up creating all kinds of digestive issues or a fungal um, overgrowth, which is candida, which so many people have heard of before, but that can be systemic. Yes, and we see right? it so much more often in a diabetic patient with high sugar levels. It's so common for us to get that overgrowth. You know, we see it all the time in hospital. Our diabetic patients with their high blood sugars would have this candida overgrowth, fungal overgrowth, but then everyone is on a spectrum. So even if you're not a diabetic, right. you can still have these periods of higher sugar where you can have candida overgrowth, mm -hmm. which is so harmful to your body. But if it doesn't get to this point where you're in hospital, no one knows it. That's right. You just, yeah, it's just that subclinical inflammation that you're having. And that's exactly what happens. And people sometimes don't realize like there is a link to things like uh, eczema and mm. psoriasis and, you know, fungal uh, toe issues um, and even infections. It, and they don't realize that it can be all linked back to sugar and to candida and to the overgrowth of this fungus. So yes, and even cancer cells grow quicker on, on sugar, you know, everything right. grows, you know, yeah, so that's a big thing. And then also it's, it's not just the self-control thing. It is something that we slowly got conditioned to and we now must be aware of it. Mm -hmm. And it's tricky because you said the average American gets 26 teaspoons or average Canadian, 26 that's teaspoons right. of sugar in our diet. Where is that sugar hidden? Yeah, so that's a great question because I think sometimes we think like, oh, people are putting 26 teaspoons of sugar in coffee and tea on grapefruit. And I think that's where we, we think sometimes that that's our idea of sugar, yes. but sugar is really, it's a crystalline substance that is in food stuffs and food stuffs, meaning, you know, it's kind of, the different sugars are named for the kind of food that it's in. So an example would be lactose. And we, we all have heard of lactose before. Which is milk sugar. It's milk sugar or maltose, which is, you know, malt or grain sugar, fructose, which is from fruit. And so we've heard of these things, sucrose 
glucose. And so they are named for the kinds of foods that they're in. But one example is high fructose corn syrup. And it is basically, it's a corn derivative. And so that's the first problem, the, the fact that it gets boiled down and it's often, it's cheap. So, you know, companies use it. But corn is a genetically modified, 92% of our corn in North America is, is genetically modified. And so it really ha- impacts our gut health. But the problem is, is that it has, it's in everything. High, fruc- high fructose corn syrup is in things like yogurt, bread, um, you know, it's in things that we deem healthy mm. and we give to our kids thinking mm. we're doing a good thing by giving them a little extra protein in your yogurt or um, a sandwich for school because it's a slice of bread. And what we don't realize is how much it penetrates so much of our food. And the other problem is, is that we have the, the no calorie sweeteners that are in everything too, mm. right? So tell our viewers what's bad with no calorie sweeteners, because, you, you know, that's what most people say first, you know, say, so if I can't have sugar, how do I sweeten? And, and then I've, I've read a book and a podcast by Mark Hyman, where he would say, Dr. Mark Hyman, where he'll say, oh, you're just an addict. That's why you want that sweetener. You should just detox from the sugar. But in reality, yes, most of us are addicts, so mm-hmm. we do want that sweet taste. But what's the problem with sweeteners? Yeah, it's a great question. And and here's the thing is that we're so hyper-focused in North America, uh, this diet culture and no calorie. We have swapped out calories for a whole lot of other problems. And so things like aspartame and sweet and low and sucralose um, and even saccharin, which was banned, funny enough, in 1977 because it's, it's a known carcinogen but just a few years ago was then allowed back into certain foods and sure. you know drinks and so it just goes to show you that we are addicted it's become an epidemic um, within our country and what's what's wrong with it is they are gut disruptors so literally can disrupt our gut flora they are carcinogenic particularly if they're used in foods that are heated up um, they're hormone dysregulators too And there's also implications because they're 200 times sweeter than regular sugar. Again, it's that dopamine. Absolutely. um, Yeah. So So it it makes us more wanting more sweet foods. And so then it's implicated in like food cravings and even things like liver damage because you are constantly producing um, sugar. Yes. And you're getting fatty liver. So even though it's empty calories, you look on the packet and you say, oh, there's no sugar and I can have it. You you still get the damage in your body. You get that insulin spike because even if no calories are coming down, your body think food is coming down. So your body is secreting insulin. That's right. So you get that insulin spike, then your blood sugar does crash. Then you really get hungry to stimulate, to get more food down. So you got to consume more calories compared to your friend who just drank water, Mm -hmm. you know, if you now had the diet pop with this sweetener in it. And I think it's important to share with people too, is that, you know, the the actual mechanism that happens when we eat um, is that just as you've explained, is that our pancreas, it, it secretes insulin to basically clean up and it goes in. And what happens is if we have extra sugar that our body, our body uses sugar, it's our primary, it uses it for For energy energy to run, to be awake. And and that's what it will go towards because it's quick energy and and our body really utilizes it well. But if there is more sugar coming in than what our body can use, utilize, then it gets stored in our liver as glycogen. And then we use that. But again, once our liver is and done. it's good if you're going for a run tomorrow. That's you're right. going to use up that glycogen. But then if you have too much. That's right. Then what happens is that it gets stored in fat cells too. And so that old adage of eating fat makes us fat, we know that that's no longer no. the case. We've dump, debunked that myth. We know that sugar makes it's the problem. fat. Yeah. And so that is the problem. And we have to make sure that people realize the mechanism behind this, right? Yes. And the, the big thing that you touched upon this hidden sugar is especially a problem for our kids. Mm-hmm. You know, I had this, I have this amazing husband and he packed school lunches for my kids this morning. And then same thing when I came down this morning, I was like, why does the kids have sugar, you know, in their lunch boxes? But from his perspective, there was no sugar. Mm-hmm. It's all snacks, but it's processed and it looks very healthy because it says organic, it says non-GMO, but it 
you know, anything that's made in a factory that's right. is processed. And, and then my patients often ask me, what's processed food? You say, stay away from process. What do we mean with processed? Mm -hmm. But that's anything that gets made in a factory, right? That's right. And I think that if you can't read, like I eat processed foods, everything is not whole all the time. You know, I had a bar this morning, but if I can read the ingredients, if it's saying things like quinoa and it's, you know, pumpkin and it's um, maple syrup, I can look at that and know the kinds of whole ingredients that are going into that. It's ingredients you have in your cupboard. Exactly. So things, but you don't have a bottle of high high fructose corn That's syrup right. in your cupboard. So exactly. if you don't have those things and all those little stars that behind the name, you know, if you don't all the have Latin those, names that we cannot yes, read, right? Yes. And and that's what we have in so many things. And and even to go back to all the aspartame, these things are even it's so prevalent that it's even in things like toothpaste mm -hmm. to make our kids sure. want to have sure. these bubblegum toothpaste and, you know, breath mints and sugar free gum. It's sugar free, but in order to make it sweet and palatable, they put low calorie or no calorie sweeteners in it. And so again, it's not that we're having 26 teaspoons extra or added sugar. In fact, I would say if you're going to have a dessert and it's a homemade dessert, that that's every once in a while, that stuff is okay. It's understanding, reading labels and making sure our day to day is not absolutely permeated with all this added and hidden sugar. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, sugar we don't even know about. That's right. And you're right, we would much rather enjoy that block of dark chocolate That's than right. have sugar in your yogurt, sugar in your granola bar, sugar in... Oh, go, go. And, and that's a big thing, becoming addicted to sugar, knowing I myself have been addicted to sugar and I didn't even know that. We went to Vietnam. I went with my husband in 2007. We were in Vietnam for three weeks and it was a wonderful experience, so beautiful, most amazing people. And there they would typically, we would have great food, you know, all these different flavors. But someone like me who was used to, I've been running marathons at the time, so mm -hmm. I had a very high calorie intake. And I was so used to having a chocolate after dinner or a dessert or something sweet after dinner. And we would, and I've never been that big on food, but very big on my sugar. And I would, um, there for the first time, there wasn't chocolate brownies on the menu, you know, for dessert, we <laughs> yes. would have fruit yeah. and beautiful. They'll make these arrangements like a swan or a phoenix mm -hmm. of all the different fruits. Absolutely spectacular. It was so good. But then I would afterwards, I would go for a walk to a corner store somewhere <laughs> to find a chocolate. And then we were on a boat for a week beautiful between islands and all our food was fresh that mm -hmm. they will catch and make for us on the boat no sugar mm -hmm. and I realized for the first time I other people would come by vendors mm -hmm. on their little boats to sell you products and I would go and try to buy things because I had no access to land no access to my sugar and I would try to buy chocolate from them and mm -hmm. they wouldn't have sugar and um, chocolate so I actually gave someone money to go and get chocolate and to come back, to go to the land, to get chocolate, to come back. And that was the first time that I realized, because mm. then I was already a doctor at the time, and I know that this is the type of behavior that you see with addicts, mm -hmm. people that would go through this trouble to get their drugs, would go through this trouble to get their alcohol. And that was such an eye opener to me, mm -hmm. someone who I thought I was very healthy. Mm -hmm. I had this organic diet, grass fed beef. I had... I've been for years before that vegan. I really thought from my perspective, I was so super, super healthy. Mm -hmm. But I realized in that moment on that holiday that I had a problem with sugar, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, and this is the thing. I think that some of us don't even realize how it has come into our life and how it's much so easy. it is. And we do live in a convenience culture. Mm -hmm. It is so simple just to go to the cupboard and grab a little something. Mm -hmm. And I started noticing I had trouble with candida and overgrowth when I finished a full meal and I was completely satiated and still wanted a yes. little something more, right? Yes. And I think it's learning that, first of all, it's a reprogramming of like, am I full? Asking yourself those questions, but having to come away from and actually detox my body from the sugar. And I see it in our children too. I see it in the way that their concentration is when they're on sugar. Um, I've actually just finished a really neat project um, helping somebody create a, a book that talks about the sugar and skin connection and how oh. important that is and the gut skin connection and how when we somebody has acne and they're dealing with acne, the first thing they go for is a topical. Yes. Right? Yes. 
But that's just putting a Band-Aid on the problem. We have to look at internal and just what does that do? How does sugar affect hormones? How does sugar affect your gut? How does sugar affect how your body is reacting? And really, this is the face or our external body is is really how it's an indication of how things are going on on In the inside, gut, right? Which we can't see as easily, exactly. but you can see your skin easily. Yes. That's right. And so we see some of that happening when people are over consuming sugar, their skin becomes really dull. Um, they end up breaking out. They have hormone issues and hormone dysregulation. So it really is, um, you know, something to consider when you're going through these things. What does your nutrition look like? Yeah, that's a big thing because I I remember, you know, the treatment modalities that I really have as a physician, if someone comes to me saying that they have acne, our first, we have kind of these three lines, we would treat the bacteria on the skin Mm -hmm. with topical antibacterial, we'll give oral antibiotics, we'll, to balance the hormones, we might give birth control. But now after I've done my training in functional medicine, Mm -hmm. I kind of realized that that's not really the way to go. We must not just give birth control to females, but say, but why are your hormones all over the place? And that's what you explained now. That's just it. it. Yes, your hormones are all over the place because you've developed leaky gut, because of the sugar. Mm -hmm. So first look at the root cause, balance your hormones, heal your inflammation, you know, correct your microbiome in your gut. Exactly. And I, and that I'm going to touch on that too, because gut health is what I really want to specialize in, but um, gut health is just so it's a cornerstone. It's key to our overall health and how our gut um, is and in the health of our gut, it influences and impacts every other organ in our body. And so, and when you think of your gut, your gut is, I know people think, oh, it's internal, but it really is almost like an open tube from your mouth all the way down to your anus. And it literally is the interface to the outside world, what we eat, what we drink, how we take things in, and how then it's dispersed throughout our entire body. And so that's really interesting to me because what we can do, our genetics play a role. What excites me is about 90% of what we are, who we are, our makeup can actually be determined by diet, our nutrition, our exercise, how our environment. And so we have some control over that. And that's amazing. Yeah. You know how we sometimes say that your genetics loads the gun. That's right. But your lifestyle pulls the trigger. I love that saying. Because some people, you know, would have the same, people will have the same genes, Mm -hmm. but some get the illness or some not. So some patients will tell me, oh, but I knew this uncle who smoked and he drank and nothing happened to him. So he didn't have that Mm -hmm. genetic risk. But then other people who do have the genetic risk, if they, even though they have a gene, then if they just have a very, very healthy lifestyle, they Mm -hmm. won't develop that illness. And we see it so common with all our diseases that in hospital that we screen for, say someone has breast cancer, Mm -hmm. we immediately screen for the gene. But if you look at what small percentage of people with breast cancer really have a positive gene for breast cancer, mm-hmm. and then even if you look at all the people who have the positive gene, not all of them develop breast cancer, a very That's small right. percentage. So there's, you know, genes explain such a small part, and then there is such a big part that mm-hmm. our lifestyle plays. And it, it's quite powerful for me to know that, mm-hmm. that I can take control of my health. Mm-hmm. Even if your grandpa had diabetes and grandma had diabetes and everyone before them, even if everyone had that colon cancer, you don't have to have that. You mm-hmm. can do things. You can implement things. To and be that's healthy. just it. And when we're born, we, we kind of, you know, in holistic care, we talk about how when you're born, you're basically born with this barrel effect. Have you heard of this? No, so it's, you know, you think of, you picture a barrel, a rain barrel. And when you're born, your barrel is fairly empty, right? Like it's, you know, it's the microbiome that you are born with, the skin microbiome, oh, that's the what's gut important microbiome. To- be that's born right. vaginally rather than that's C-section because right. then you get some bacteria. You yes. get some we healthy bacteria, that. yes, that's right? Important. It yes. is important. And obviously mm. if you can't, you know, however the birth happens, it happens, whatever safest for mom and for baby. But if you can be born vaginally, that sets the baby up for life, really. Yeah, stronger immune system, yes. Absolutely. Lots of research on that, yeah. And we really, really see that. But what happens is this barrel the stress barrel that happens or our lifestyle is our lifestyle, medications, um, you know, our nutrition, stress, how well are we sleeping? All these things get added into the barrel. Your barrel is going to look different than my Mm. barrel. And so 
genes go in there as well. And we just don't know when that overflow is going to happen. And so overflow starts with symptoms and then the symptoms start to come and then conditions and diseases if those symptoms get overlooked. And so I always explain this to my clients is that we really want to be putting good things in our barrel and taking out those bad things. And we can negotiate um, as best as we know how what that barrel is going to look like by by the things that we're putting in it or the positive things that we're putting in it. Sure, that's a very good analogy mm-hmm. that you're giving. I love that about the barrel being full and you don't know when it's going to overflow. You don't. And that's the big thing. You recommended that I read a boot, book by Gabor Mate. Mm-hmm. It's such an incredible book, When the Body Says No, where it talks about that. Whereas I can cope with a big amount of stress for a very long period of time. Mm-hmm. But then one day your body just says no. That's you know, right. and it's that day that you develop that cancer or that mm-hmm. autoimmune disease. Things that you might have been able to prevent if you adjusted your lifestyle 10 years ago. That's right. And then to specifically know when, and we have so much research showing that same people with the same illness have different times that they live, you know, and there's so there's things that we can do to turn mm-hmm. our illness around. There's things that we can do to prevent that illness. That's right. And to be be aware of those hidden stressors. Yes. And so getting to the root cause mm-hmm. is why we're here. Yes. It's why we get excited to share with people. And, you know, again, going back to sugar, sugar is something that can be so addictive. And so detoxing your body, because as you've talked about, like sugar feeds cancer cells. We also know that sugar connects to viral, like viruses. Yes. So it lowers your immunity. It lowers your immunity. That's and this is very one. important. So every time you have sugar, and this is kind of what I share even with my kids, it's like every time you have a, a bite of sugar, anything, you literally numb your immunity for about four to five hours. So think about sure. how we eat. You know, if you're eating three square meals in a day, there's a little bit more time between the meals. But if you're like a lot of people who graze, yes. all and I'm day a big long, grazer. That's yeah. a big thing. Uh, it's just like we don't ever we don't get that time. that time to recover, and yeah, so your immunity is con- you're constantly at a disadvantage, and you're lowering your immunity, and actually affects the white blood cell counts. Um, you know, it lowers your white blood cells, those those cells that like fight infection, yeah. and so it's really important to know what it can do to our body. And that slots in quite to intermittent fasting as well, which you were talking about that grazing. And I I went through high school through this period where I was doing excessive sports and I had periods of low blood sugar Mm. and I didn't know what was wrong. We tested and my sugar was too low. So then I went, my mom took me to a dietitian and she went to, because especially the way our school situation was, we didn't have like my kids a lunchtime and an outside recess time. We just had one time Mm. where you had to eat and play. And then obviously little kids much rather play they, around. They want to play. Eat. Yes, Absolutely. just gotta sit under the tree with your lunchbox if you can just go and play, right? Absolutely. So I would be running, running, running both recesses and then maybe not having lunch and we would have athletics practice after school. So it was like this go, go, go all day without eating. And then the dietitian specifically taught me, which was the correct thing in that time, is to have more frequent meals, to mm-hmm. always have a protein, which I didn't know, my mum didn't know, explaining that the protein keeps you from that sugar spike, sugar, right. sugar lower, but to, then to have protein. And then the rest of my life, I've been continuing to do that, to just eat all the time. Mm-hmm. So I'm continuously, I'll have nuts, I'll have pr- cheese, I'll have protein, I'll mm-hmm. eat, 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 eat. Then all this research came out now with intermittent fasting and how that yes. boosts your immune system, fights disease. Dr. Jason Fang here at the University of Toronto did a mm-hmm. lot of research for cancer, for mm-hmm. diabetic patients, patients on dialysis, showing how important it is to have fasting periods. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Will you tell me about that? Or maybe tell our viewers who are not familiar with fasting, what is fasting? Sure. So intermittent fasting is time-released eating or time-restricted um, restricted eating. eating. And so what ends up happening is, I think some people think like you, it's always this 16 hours of not eating or fasting in an eight-hour window period, but it can be different. It can look different. And there's all different kind of fasting methods. Because we, we naturally fast. When we, we do. sleep, we don't eat. So That's all right. of us fast at least eight hours while we're sleeping. That's right. Exactly. So what this one is saying is just to extend that window a little bit mm-hmm. to have your dinner maybe a bit earlier mm-hmm. and your breakfast a little bit later. That's right. 
That's right. And I think there's a lot of benefits. Um, I'm careful not to say it's a one size fits all Mm -hmm. because I do think, as you've talked about, there are people who might have low blood sugar and have blood sugar issues or having difficulty with regulating blood sugar. Um, And it might be for people who have really low BMIs, uh, you, you might not want to do intermittent fasting, but they have shown benefits of intermittent fasting, particularly for diabetics. Um, and women, we do have to be a little careful, uh, with our hormone regulation. Again, it's not one size fits all. So I tried intermittent fasting and I, I feel like my sweet spot is between 12 hours and 14 hours. Anything more than that, I feel shaky and I actually don't Mm. have, um, a lot of energy and it can start affect female hormones as well. And so, even 12 hours, it does your body a lot of good because you're, you're, while you're sleeping, you're able to process all the sugar, detox all of that out of your system. And I like to have a morning workout. So my morning workout is fasted, mm-hmm. but then I can have a smoothie right after. And so I'm going 12, 13 hours every day uh, without eating. And that fasting time, I find working out in a fasted state because I do a morning um, workout, I feel amazing doing that. So, oh, that's good. And then our brains, it's also shown to, for people to have less dementia mm-hmm. when they do that because we have this in- incredible system in our brain called our glymphatic system mm-hmm. with a G, so it's like lymphatic with a G, glymphatic system. And that system can work and it, it really helps to prevent dementia. It mops up all the bad cells. But while you're eating, it's mopping up sugar, mopping up sugar. So only once you stop eating, it gives your body a break Mm -hmm. from mopping up sugar. And then it can go to your brain and mop up harmful cells that will help prevent dementia. And that that moves into like the whole talk about a keto diet too, because that's why people that have neurodegenerative diseases like an Alzheimer's or a Parkinson's or even epilepsy. It's in kids with epilepsy. We do it all the time to put them on a ketogenic diet. That's right. because it is helpful because it will go in, it will use ketones um, instead of using the sugar and mop up all of those things that are in there, right? So it becomes a, a benefit. But like intermittent fasting, keto is not a one size fits all, but it can help people like a di- type two diabetic who really is craving that sugar and really needs to balance that blood sugar instead of using glucose as the primary energy source, um, along with intermittent fasting, it could be really useful to helping control the blood sugar, control those cravings and help to actually, maybe even you start to see um, people losing weight Mm -hmm. and getting off of some of their diabetic medication or even lowering dosages. I see it all the time. Mm -hmm. And I've had great success with my patients on ketogenic diet, Mm -hmm. but then we have to be very careful when we do prescribe a high fat, low carb diet to explain that people can't have it with sugar because that's when you're running into trouble. That's right. Your body can very easily, if you look at how our ancestors lived two three thousand years ago where they didn't have access to all these sugar they would eat protein and when they did have access to sugar it wasn't a fruit you know it was different but but yeah we're at a high risk for disaster Mm -hmm. especially i remember when i've been on a ketogenic diet i would eat perfect on a ketogenic diet but then i would still have maybe a chocolate brownie or a chocolate you know and and that is harmful so you really have to be careful and choose Mm sugar-free and ketogenic Mm -hmm. Because because the sugar and the fat together is harmful. It is. And I think people have to understand truly what a ketogenic diet, it's it's not an easy thing. No. You have to be really careful about your macronutrients because a ketogenic diet is 70% of a quality fat. And that's the other thing I always share with people. It's not just 70% fat, it's 70% quality fat mm. and it's 25% protein and 5% carbohydrates. And so you have to really reframe how you've probably been eating for the majority of your life to really get into true ketosis and to do it well. And the other thing too is to, to talk about intermittent fasting along with ketosis and the ketogenic diet is that if you're restricting your time frame and that you're eating and you're only eating in an eight hour window, you're, you're likely eating less calories. And so you will oftentimes lose some weight, but it's about what you choose to eat in that time frame. Mm. It's so, so important to get the maximum benefit for your body and to support your body really well. You don't want to be eating. I have a friend who is, you know, doing time restricted eating 
and then still eating almost the same amount of calories in the eight hour time frame, but getting it through not so great sources. See, and that's the that's key. It. That's the key. Whether you're eating in a s- smaller time frame, bigger, the amount of calories is not as important, but it's what are you putting, you know, and that's what we're talking about, whole foods. It uh, Key is to see this food, mm-hmm. does it come from a factory or yes. is this the way that it comes from a farm? Anything, you know, and that's why there is a bit of a movement now away again from a vegan diet where we say that meat is okay, not factory farmed meat, but the way it looks on a farm, carrots and, and apples and things, not in a puree or mm-hmm. in a dessert, but the way it looks on a farm, that's the way it should go to your plate. That's the way you should eat it. That's the way we should give it to our kids. Yeah. And I, I think I like what you touched on too, because I know um, like plant-based, and I like to, to actually talk about that differently and say plant-rich diet, because we do see, studies have shown, all the research, the evidence is really showing that a quality fat, a quality a grass-fed beef or you know non-hormone, no steroids, uh, chicken and poultry and other things, fish... Um, not factory farmed fish, but a wild salmon can do a lot Mm. for your body. In fact, leaky gut is part of what happens when you eat too much sugar in a, in a corn syrup, you know, idea is that it causes leaky gut. And I see that in some of my vegan patients. Mm -hmm. So they eat it, especially younger people in their twenties, they, that live a little bit more in a fast food culture. Mm -hmm. So they are eating vegan, you know, which is great for the environment, but then for their bodies, it has to be vegan whole foods. It's not healthier if you eat vegan processed foods That's out right. of a packet like fake burger, fake pasta, fake cheese, fake everything. Exactly. You know? Yeah. I mean, obviously, there's we can talk. It's a totally different topic. Talk about sustainable farming and all yes, of that, we'll, which I'll, I'll we'll get do you another back. podcast yes, on yes, that because I am passionate about that. that too. That's, that's a big topic. Yes, yes it and is. I'm sure our audience would love to hear about that. Yes, so we'll get you back. Yes, but for sugar. So to wrap it mm-hmm. up, do you recommend a detox of sugar, a slow decline? Because I see some of my patients who say they can't get off sugar. They are often the people who need to detox. Mm -hmm. Because if you've gone without sugar for 10 days, you'll have no cravings. I can guarantee that. Go without sugar for 10 days and your cravings will go away. Yeah. I think can, people have to be willing. Yes. And that's the thing, obviously. We I'm start with that. Gain days. for that. It's true. <laughs> but I will say that even within 24 to 48 hours, you'll really st- start to see um, inflammation going down. You'll start to lose water weight. So we hold water sometimes when we're inflamed. You know, we'll be, we'll have extra water in our system. You'll see things like that happen. You'll you'll find that your cravings decrease after just a few days. You might might get, and I tell people often about the Hersheimer or the Herx reaction, I think this is important to educate clients and educate people. Sometimes when you're detoxing from something, you'll often find that you get headaches. These are these are withdrawal symptoms, right? Like mm-hmm. almost an addict. You might have um, gut disruption, um, your bathroom, um, you know, you might eliminate differently. And those things can happen when you are detoxing. What should our viewers do or our listeners do if it happens? Yeah. Well, one thing I would say is that um, if you are detoxing, drink lots of water, like seven to eight. Extra water to push Extra water, push everything through. The more we eliminate, the more the toxins are going. Eat high fiber veggies and fruit. Fiber, soluble fiber is amazing to bind toxins, to detox our body, but also it, it expands in our gut and really helps us to stay full and satiated. So it can kind of replace um, and help us feel content so that we're not looking for more sugar. So soluble fibers would be mm-hmm. things like chia seeds. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And so things like even avocado, artichoke is a high fiber, broccoli, um, a high fiber fruit would be like something like raspberry. And so you can put those things, those whole foods into your diet um, and you'll you'll feel better. You will start to eliminate. The other thing, and you touched on it earlier, is I always share with people to balance out your blood sugar and to feel great, to make sure that you have a protein, a quality fat, and a fiber at with e- every meal. meal. Every meal. See, that's a big thing. And I see, especially my female patients, mm-hmm. for some reason, are so low on protein. That's like the first thing mm-hmm. I do with everyone. Just add protein. If someone says they're overweight, I'm like, okay, just add protein. Yeah. Because you're going to feel fuller. Add fat. Because you're right. going to feel fuller. Then you're not going to have to eat 
the whole day. And you know what? Even if it's a smoothie, pack that smoothie full of like an MCT oil. So an MCT oil will help curve cravings, um, but it's also amazing for brain health and it's a quality it's a quality fat. Or sticking a nut butter that's not processed, maybe a raw nut butter in there. And so you're getting extra fat or protein in adding hemp hearts. Like even if you love your toast, you know, in the morning and you're putting something like a an almond butter on it, adding some hemp hearts for a little extra protein will help slow down the that digestion process. Spike. Yes. You won't get that sugar spike yes. and then you won't be craving and hungry in another hour. And, and there was this Big, interesting study. That's one of the first things that opened my eyes because mm. I grew up in the 80s where we were at no fat in mm -hmm. our diet, mm -hmm. not a lot of protein, according to what the food pyramid from the World Health Organization mm -hmm. looked at at the time. So a little bit fat, a little bit more protein, and then primarily grains. Mm -hmm. Then they've done a very big study in the US where they had a group of kids that they followed through primary school, through high school. They followed them 10, 20 years as adults. And the one group of kids got fat-free milk every day and mm -hmm. the other group got full fat milk. The, that's the only thing. Same diet, same everything else. And then actually the group on the low fat consumed more calories mm -hmm. during the rest of the day because the full fat, full cream milk group was more, they had more satiety, mm -hmm. so they wouldn't consume as many calories. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it was just leading to habits, but then that same group because they were only giving the, given the fat free or full cream milk in school. But then when they followed that same group of kids, whereas the full fat kids weighed less, but they continued to weigh a couple of pounds less in adulthood mm -hmm. compared to their counterparts who were on the fat free diet. Yes. And so that, that is absolutely fascinating. Well, and we see too, there's a, a really great study done, an inner city study. So we know the socioeconomics play a role oh, in sure. this too. But what they, did, what they did is they went to a school and they gave three square meals to kids that probably weren't getting fed very well, <clears throat> pardon me, outside of school. What they showed, and this was incredible, is they showed a 10 to 20% increase in their test results. Sure. So their That's brain, and, yes, because they're eating good quality foods versus highly processed foods that break down as sugar in the body, right? And so yeah. it is really important to make sure yeah. uh, that we can be getting these great foods in. Yes, yeah, for to make ourselves healthier, to mm -hmm. prevent illness, mm -hmm. and then also for our kids to really give them that edge and to prevent mm -hmm. illness. Thank you so much, Gina, for spending time with me today. This was so fun. I appreciate <laughs> it. Thank you to all our viewers and all our listeners. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel today. You can have a look. There's so many resources on my website. We'll have free resources from you as well in the link below. And you can find Gina. What is your Instagram handle? So it's gina.gala.alfieri. And I will be putting in a, a recipe booklet uh, with healthy sweets, healthy treats awesome. for the family, for all of Daniela's um, viewers. So feel free to go in there and get that free recipe download. Thank you so much for watching. Subscribe to YouTube today. Until next time, take care. Thank you for joining us for Health and Wellness Talk with Dr. Daniela Stein. Subscribe to our YouTube channel today. Connect with Dr. Stein at www.daniellastein.com. The content of this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your healthcare provider. Never disregard medical advice or delay seeking it because of something you have heard on this talk show. Remember, you were created to thrive.